Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our town forum. Uh, we normally like to hold these uh, these forums every year, but unfortunately, last year because of COVID, uh, we weren't able to hold it. And again, this year we would have liked to held it in uh, sometime in July in the summertime, but again with COVID regulations, uh, we were unfortunately not able to do it. So uh, we felt it was still important to have it whenever the regulations had opened up. So that's why we're here today. I want to thank everybody for registering ahead of time. Um, uh, as you know, COVID regulations, you can see six feet spacings and uh, 50 people within the community center. So uh, thank you again. What we're going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce our members of council here, our CAO and the other people that are here. Um, what we're going to do afterwards, each member will be speaking a bit about their portfolios and the activities that have occurred in their portfolios. And then afterwards, we will be uh, having some questions and answers. We're hoping that we, we did receive a bunch of questions. We asked people to put forth their questions so that we made sure that we wanted to address those questions throughout the presentation. And that's why if any of those questions are not answered uh, during the presentation, just bring them up again and we'll uh, try to answer them the best we can with the information that we have. And if you require more information, we will uh, get back to you as well uh, with the appropriate information for you. Okay, so uh, the, the first thing I, oh, the other thing I'd like to make sure too. This is a, uh, it's a public forum and it's very important that we have a proper decorum at the, at the meeting. Uh, the councils are here to answer questions. Uh, we're not here for uh, debates. Uh, if you have questions, please address, uh, address uh, myself. Identif if you could identify who you are and where you live so that we can better understand the areas that you're living in and, uh, and we'll go from there. We also have a presentation this morning from uh, Valley Fiber. Uh, Valley Fiber is a company that uh, was able to, uh, or is able to provide fiber optic lines for internet. Um, municipalities around Manitoba have been working very hard to improve internet service throughout Manitoba. And if you guys are on your internet, you know that the internet is very important to allow us. For people that were working from home, it even becomes more important because of information. And we have been approached uh, and given, uh, uh, we've given them uh, the uh, ro a way, uh, <laughs> right of way, right of way access throughout the town. They'll be speaking more about this and the right of way uh, basically provide, lets them uh, provide their, uh, provide their fiber optics throughout the community. So you'll be seeing in the next little while some work around the community and it will be the fiber optic people putting in the cables and so forth. And again, like I said, they will be speaking very shortly. So we have coffee and we have some water there. So if you'd like some water or coffee, just please go up. The meeting is, the forum is till 12 o'clock. We wanna to keep to our timelines. I know everybody's busy. So we'll try to keep it till 12 o'clock. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce our council. I have to the right of me, Deputy Mayor Daryl Carey. And next to him, we have Larry Banks. And the far left, we have Jean Genron. And next to her, we have Barry Houle. And sitting uh, next to me, we have our CAO, uh, Kerry Swanson. Behind him, we have our Finance manager, we have Mark Brasley. I did it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> uh, Mark is our finance fella, and he's also our tech guy. He's really good with the tech, and we're videotaping this, and we're live streaming it as well, so anybody at home can also watch this. And then we have at the front uh, front desk there, we have Arthur King, who mm -hmm. is our uh, our program manager for the community center. So again. Right now, 
I would like to thank everybody for all the council members and staff for being here to put on this tour. Right now, I'd like to call upon Zach Dur Durbrandt to do the presentation on the fiber optic system that's going into town. <laughs> All right, so like uh, Mayor Tony said, my name is Zach Durbrandt. I live in a town called Gretna, Manitoba, which is right along the U.S. border. Um, I work for Valley Fiber, or an internet company that is coming up north of Winnipeg and love to present to you guys what we're doing and what we're going to be offering in the community in the next couple of months. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, you might be wondering how Valley Fiber started or when we started. Um, we started off as a wireless provider called VIT, Valley Internet Service Provider, that did towers and radios, and we still have that aspect of, of our company, and we will bring towers to the area in the coming years to allow access to internet to people that are outside of the community that don't get the fiber lines. Um, but we started running fiber in Winkler, where our home base is, um, in 2017. So our first customer went live in 2017, and we finished the completion of the fiber optic internet in Winkler in 2018. Um, since then, we have really exploded. We now service over 10,000 customers in southern Manitoba, and we're expanding quite rapidly. We are currently in construction in, I think, 20 communities all over Manitoba. Um, and we are just south of here in Clan Du Bois right now, bringing the fiber line there. Um, once we're done in Clan Du Bois and Petersfield, the crews are coming up here to continue the, the work in the Matlock, Winnipeg, East, and Newcastle region. Um, so you might be wondering what kind of internet that we get. Um, not all fiber is the same, so even within Winnipeg, there's a bunch of different fiber providers, and we all do fiber slightly different. The industry standard for internet for both fiber, copper, and wireless is a technology called GPON. So pretty much all the other providers do this type of technology. They come, they bring a pipe to a town, let's say a town this size, they might have uh, a thousand megabits brought to the town, and from there they split off, and every single person in the town shares that internet. So you might, if you run a speed test at two in the morning and no one else is on, you're probably getting the speeds that you're paying for, but right after school or during really peak times, everyone's internet slows down because they're all trying to access that same pipe at the same time. What makes Valley Fiber very special and very different is that we use a technology called Active Ethernet. So we bring a single fiber from Winkler, our data center in Winkler, to every single house in every single community that we connect. So there's no more, oh, what's my neighbor doing? They are really heavy internet users, so my internet always sucks. There's no more of that. It is whatever you're paying for, that price is guaranteed, or that speed is guaranteed, just because of the way that we built this network. Yeah, so there's no up to on none of our promotional material, on none of the agreements. Does it ever say Valley Fiber promises up to a certain speed? You always get the speed that you're paying for. That, of course, is to the, like, the Wi-Fi router itself. Wi-Fi as a whole is a little bit more of a flawed technology and speeds vary widely. So if, you are, if your router is down in the basement and you're on the very far side of your property, you're probably not going to get a speed test result that is exactly that speed, um, but we have the ability to run speed tests on hardline computers or on the router itself to, to show that you are always getting that speed. And I have, I have Valley Fiber at home, and if people are wanting confirmations, I have lots of screenshots on my phone that I can show people that, that I am actually getting the speeds that I'm paying for. Um, so what does this, or uh, why do we do a dedicated network? Um, Infrastructure now um, in most of Manitoba is quite outdated. <coughs> there was fiber or copper put into the ground a really long time ago, and that infrastructure has not aged incredibly well. 
So everyone sees our suffering, um, and the way that it was in and implemented, it wasn't very easy to upgrade. I'll get into a little bit about our construction process and what we do to mitigate this, um, but Valley Fiber definitely saw a need that we couldn't just come in on existing infrastructure because there was just too many bottlenecks. So we bring our own pipe everywhere we go, just to make sure that we control the whole pro process from your house to our data center so we can guarantee those speeds. Um, part of the reason why Valley Fiber was started, um, our, our CEO, Hank Wall, um, was tired of what he called the brain drain from Winkler. So Winkler is a pretty big city, but they saw that all of the young people were always leaving. They were starting businesses and then going to Winnipeg or going to Calgary or going to Toronto because there was not the needs that they needed. The needs that they had were not met with the current infrastructure. So he was tired of it and he wanted to do something about it. So he created this world-class internet to help people stay <coughs> rural. We are, as a company, we're tired of all the people, all of the money going to these major metropolises where all the resources seem to go. So we are bringing it to rural Manitoba, which we're pretty excited about. Um, this is kind of, uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it from the back, but can show how that G pond works compared to how we do it. You can see all the fiber lines going directly to each house instead of one line going and then breaking off from there. Um, the analogy that we always use is like a highway. So if you have decent internet on your, at your house, let's say you have 25 megabits a second internet, that is your speed limit. So if you look, think about it like a highway, you are allowed to drive that fast on the highway, but if every single person tries to get on the highway at the same time, everyone's speed slows down. Mm -hmm. On our network, it is like you have your own guaranteed highway. You'll have to share it with anyone else. Um, just recently, we were voted uh, Manitoba's best um, internet provider for gaming, as well as second best in the country um, for gaming. <coughs> I'm looking around the room, and there's probably not all that many gamers here <laughs> right now. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is reliant on, oh yeah, I can headshot as many people as possible on Fortnite. Gaming um, utilizes things like latency and download and jitter, and that's all things that each one of us use every day. If we've done video calls, a really strong connection that has low latency makes it so there's not that awkward pause after you finish a sentence and then you wait for the person to, to hear you and you get back. Like it really speeds up more things than just, just gaming, but we were voted best and we like to show it off because we're really proud of, of the internet that we've developed and that we're bringing around to people. Um, the only team that we lost to was a company called Beanfield Metro. They are out of Toronto and the, they service three condo buildings that are on top of their data center. So they are not traveling nearly as far as we are, so it's a little bit of a stacked field, but you can see that we are miles ahead of other people like Virgin and Saskel, Shaw, all the other people, we are miles ahead of, of them and again, we're very proud of that and the fact that we're bringing it to a place like Winnipeg Beach um, is not happening really anywhere else in the country. So in terms of services, um, we offer four types of services. We have your basic internet services, so what you use to watch Netflix or video call, things like that. Um, we are also now a TV provider as well. We are a, a TV carrier and we offer cutting edge uh, TV technologies. We can do things like 30 hour playback. So if you miss your channel, any one of our, our channels, you can go back 30 hours and watch it without recording. Um, as well as we have a network DVR that you can record as well, just like your Shaw or your, your MTS can do right now. Um, we offer a phone solution as well. We are a licensed phone carrier. We are able to port your existing number from presumably Bell to us, and phone prices start at $20 a month, which is pretty great for unlimited Canada-wide calling. So that's kind of unheard of when you're thinking analog. Um, it is a, a voice phone or a digital phone. Um, some people get scared about 
it being VoIP. I know a lot of people have had issues with VoIP connections in the past. Um, 20 years ago when VoIP started coming in, all of the data centers were in like Calgary or Toronto. So you were using your, your slow internet to try to get to Calgary and back to make phone calls. Um, on, our, on our dedicated fiber, it is lightning quick, as well as all of the, the switching and the voice controls happen in Winkler. So you're not leaving the province for the next year. Um, and we are a tier three data center as well. So our data center in Winkler um, is built to specifications that the Pentagon could put some services in there and we would meet their needs. We have backup power, multiple redundancies of backup power. Our walls are extremely thick to prevent earthquakes and who knows what. Um, I don't think any of you will be utilizing that service as like needing services there. Um, but what that does mean, um, I think we all remember the Thanksgiving storm. I don't know how it affected you guys up here, but down south we were really out of commission. There was, all the power was down since everything is, is up in the sky. Um, or run on telephone poles. Um, people that internet went down or power went down, they were kind of stuck without internet. Everything we do is in the ground and every spot along the way has backup power, things like that. So people that had um, like in batteries connected to their routers were actually still able to use the internet during that big power outage. And in our data center, we had power because we had our diesel generator backup. And we could see the lights going on all over southern Manitoba when people's generators would flip on and they were continuing to use the internet and be able to contact people on the outside. And that's all because we build everything to that tier three standard. <coughs> so you might be wondering um, how we get the fiber here. I know that's a big, big question. Everything we do is in the ground and we put everything inside of the conduit. So what I was saying before about how the infrastructure in place now is quite dated and it's really hard to upgrade, part of that reason is they just direct bury things in the ground so they can't easily pull it out and put it back in. Everything that we do is in that conduit. So if something would happen to the fiber or let's say in 50 years, there's another new technology that is better, faster than fiber, we can come in, pull it out, push it back through and we don't have to bring any more drills back to the community to do that work because we do it all, all now. So we bring a single fiber to every house, um, but we do only connect the houses that sign up for our services. So in a place like Winnipeg Beach, we, when we're doing the planning, we bring enough fibers to the community that if everyone would want to sign up, we'll definitely have enough fiber to do that, as well as we do think about how communities are expanding. Um, but if you aren't signed up for the services, the drills go past your house. Um, doesn't mean that you can never get connected, just once we leave a community, we wait for enough people to be interested to justify bringing the drill back to, to do some more work. So it might not have a, a cost penalty, but there's no timeline on when the drills will be back to do the work. Um, but doesn't mean that, that you are stuck because we, we always do come back. Um, yeah, and this, all this means with the dedicated fibers, everything in the ground, that we do guarantee a speed. I say it quite often, but no one else, there's no other provider that is guaranteeing speeds. And we, we say it pretty loud and proud um, because there's just no one else that can do it. So I'm gonna show a video next. It's gonna go through our construction process a little bit more, as well as the installation process inside your house. It's just about two minutes or so, and then I'll quickly wrap up, um, and, then you got, and then we can keep on going. Hi, I'm Tim with Team Valley Fiber, and I'm here to share with you how we get our internet from our data center to your home. Our fiber starts in our data center in Winkler, Manitoba, and we bring it through a main line to your community. For us to get our fiber to your community, we need to bring it down highways and through neighborhoods, down proposed routes, so that everyone's able to get dedicated fiber. Before we do any drilling in your community, we need to flag proposed routes to each home as well as each neighborhood so we know where we need to be drilling.
When we get to your community, we go to an underground drilling method called directional drilling. That allows us to run our fiber underground in conduit, and then we don't have to disturb any of the grass or any of the ground above it. Once we have tested that line all the way from your home to our data center, then you are ready for install. When your home is ready for install and you have your appointment, we will come to your home and the first thing we'll do is we'll ask you where you want your router to be located. Sometimes there's other infrastructure like telephone lines inside of your home, but that doesn't matter because we have a dedicated own fiber line that we're able to run in a non-invasive way within your house. We're able to run our fiber line in attics, crawl spaces, through floor joists, as well as inside walls. That way you'll have a very finished look that doesn't have any exposed wires. Once we've connected your router and the install is complete, we run a speed test. The connection test is to ensure that your speeds are strong and that they are guaranteed to what you've signed up for because of a dedicated fiber from our data center to your home. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we are just wanting to come and get as many people connected on our fiber on the internet as possible in the area. Um, and if you are interested in getting connected, we will be here um, to answer some questions after the meeting is done because people often have questions and that's understandable. Um, if you are wanting to get signed up in the area, if you go to connectmanitoba.com, that is, has all the information for pricing and things like that and we can get you signed up there as well. Um, I will just make quick mention, part of the reason why we are able to come to Winnipeg Beach as well as expand as fast as we are right now, um, we do have um, quite, quite a substantial loan from the federal government. Um, they are back in this project to come here um, to bring services to the community um, called the Canada Infrastructure Bank. Um, you can, there's a couple of articles online. Um, we're very excited to be partnering with the federal government to bring internet to the underserviced or uh, yeah, underserviced communities uh, throughout Manitoba because there's such a need for, for better connections. Um, so I think I, that's all the time I will take. I went over my timeline but just a little bit, but um, we'll be here at the end if you guys have any questions at all. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, we'll continue on, and uh, uh, my portfolio is legislative, and with legislative, I sit on different boards. One of the boards that we sit on, in fact, is uh, Community Futures, which has been working with, uh, with different uh, internet providers to get quicker internet. We, just, we at the last forum, that was one of the, one of the things that people uh, had, had talked about was the internet speeds and stuff, and we've been trying to communicate with uh, with Bell to improve their system. Uh, they're above lines. Uh, there are different providers out there right now, like Starlink, I think it's called, that, that uses a different system, satellite system and stuff. Um, Community Futures looked at all the different uh, all the different providers in that, and we were fortunate uh, that uh, we we did meet with Valley Fiber. In fact, I've been to their I've been to their their site there. Uh, they call it the cloud. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you the cloud. One thing that I noticed right away in the cloud, it's a bomb-proof uh, type of uh, space. But there's no bathroom in the cloud. Just so you guys know, <laughs> there's no bathroom in the cloud. <laughs> you have to get out of that room. Uh, but just so you know, there is that we provide the right of way for any service provider that comes to us for that right of way. We recently approved a right of way for Bell to run a fiber optic from their station to the towers on Kernstead. So uh, any provider is, uh, is allowed to come in. Uh, we found their, their system here, again, uh, it's up to the individual to determine what system that they want in. Uh, they're spending, I think it's roughly $4 million of infrastructure within the town of Winnipeg Beach. And the good thing that we really, really enjoy is that there's no cost to the taxpayers to install the s service. 
the one thing that we had to provide was a small piece of uh, property. We have a piece of property on the uh, west side that is not really used for anything. It's uh, looking at a 40 by 40 piece where they're going to put their connection unit and, uh, or their hub station where everything goes in and then goes further. And that's all we had to provide. And it have, didn't, didn't cost us anything. Uh, they put up the building, the fencing and so forth. So um, again, it took a long time and the different groups, which I'll speak on, uh, that was one of the main things that we, we were really pushing the federal and provincial government is to improve internet speeds. <coughs> and lo and behold, we finally got, we're going to be getting quicker internet speeds. Uh, so the Community Future is also the group that uh, right now there was that federal uh, COVID grants that were going out, the 40 and the 20,000 uh, loans for businesses around the interlake. Uh, we've given over, 40, uh, over $4 million in uh, loans to uh, businesses and to farming, the farming community to keep uh, going. Uh, it's a, it was a, a loan that $20,000 was forgivable. Um, and we've done, like I said, over uh, $4 million. Community Futures is a group that tries to help entrepreneurs to start up businesses. And we were, uh, we were, uh, able, to, uh, we were able to provide the, that funding through the federal government to keep businesses going. The other group that I belong to uh, is the Interlake Mayors and Reed. This is a new group that has just started about a year and a half ago. It's all the mayors and reeves in the interlake. We're similar communities and we have similar problems. Uh, we're different from like the Brandon area, the West area, the Brandon, the Southern areas. So the group has gotten together and this is the other thing that we did was we lobbied the government for the internet. We've been lobbying the government for uh, funding, additional funding for different communities. Uh, like for example, there are three communities uh, that are funded by permanent residents, even though we have a high seasonal population, we only get funding for the permanent residents. And as you know, Winnipeg Beach, we're a year-round community. And we have to continue on with road clearing and so forth. So the funding is very important to us. And what has happened in the past, uh, we only get the permanent residents. We have uh, 1,100 permanent residents and a lot of times our government funding is based on that amount. So we've been trying to lobby the government, along with the help of other interlake mayors, to change that formula so that we can in fact get additional funding for grants and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, another group that we deal with is the South Basin Mayors and Reeves. These are the mayors from Gimli, Alexander, St. Clements, St. Andrews, uh, Winnipeg Beach, the Nodder, and what we look at is the health of the lake. We've been lobbying the government for many, many years to improve the quality of the lake. We've put up a, a lake-friendly program. Uh, you can go into uh, the lake-friendly website and get information there on what you as individuals can do for your household and what businesses can do to prevent uh, chemicals and other products going into the lake. So we've been working really hard with that. We've also provided funding for another group that we're involved with, the South Basin, or the South Basin Mares and Reeves. The South Basin Mares and Reeves deals with water quality as well. And they have just recently and they've been working on this, trying to get this project going for the last four years. And this is to improve the Netley Marsh area because the Netley Marsh area is the area that takes all the, all the products that are coming into from all over uh, Manitoba and outside of, uh, outside of Manitoba and filters all the nutrients and, or the uh, nitrogens and all these other products that are har harmful to, for the lake. And because of uh, the way the uh, Netley Marsh has been destroyed, what they're doing is they're actually 
dredging, part of the opening of the mouth, and they're building landmass areas in the Netley Creek to establish growth, vegetation growth. And they've just completed, they, but they finally got all their approvals to go ahead and do it, and they've just completed the first phase of it, and they've been dredging the materials and pumping it in the Netley Creek area. And again, you can go onto the website and look up the Netley Creek uh, Marsh Project. So, these are things that you might not realize that Winnipeg Beach Council are promoting and encouraging because we all understand the importance of the lake. Our tax base is based on the viability of the lake. So we all work into making sure that our lake is healthy. Um, what's the other one? Oh, uh, also I sit on the Interlake Regional Health Authority and what we have been working on for a couple of years, ever since we lost our local doctor, Dr. Patel, who retired, we now have a nurse practitioner. It's a health, uh, I think, uh, go ahead and talk about that. Well, it's just, we were able to, uh, Larry will speak a bit more about it. We were able to secure a nurse practitioner in the same area. So now we do have uh, a medical person available for people in the area. We've also been working with them, and again, these are the, this is the whole Interlake region, all of, and even in the south, looking for, one of the things that we have found is that lack of doctors in the area. So we have been working very, very hard to establish a, resi a residency training center, and we're, we're hopefully getting very close to it. We've had a couple of hiccups with government funding. Well, it's not, we're not even asking for government funding, but just government support for this residency program. And what they found is that with a residency program, these doctors go into the rural areas, and a lot of times they stay in those rural areas. So we're trying to get more doctors within the uh, East Interlake Region Health Authority area. We're hoping, we're hoping that the facility will be built by next year and it will be located at the Selkirk Hospital and that will, will allow us to bring in more doctors, uh, graduating doctors into the residency program because what happens is in order for them to get their complete doctorate, they have to go through a residency program and the East Interlake program is the only region that doesn't have a facility for them. We do now have, uh, I think it was, we're up to four doctors that are in that program, and they're gonna be based out of Selkirk, but they will travel throughout the East Interlake area, okay? <clears throat> I think that's, that covers, oh, I, just so you know too, as a community, as counselors, we always try to take the opportunity to spend your money wisely. We always look for monies that we can leverage against grants. For example, this year we were very fortunate, and uh, Daryl will speak a little bit, a bit about it, is we were able to secure funding for infrastructure, such as sewer lines, water, and so forth. We recognized that our infrastructure is older, things are developing in Winnipeg Beach, and we want to be prepared. So we were able to leverage uh, 50 cent dollars on all the work that we've been trying to get accomplished. And again, like I said, Councillor Deputy Mayor Darrell will speak a bit about that. So we've been working very hard to <coughs> utilize your money as best we can, and in some cases, we do get the grants, in other cases, we don't get the grants, but we keep on trying, and that's why sometimes you'll see a delay on things. If we say we're gonna do a project, it's usually based on some other grants that we can get in order to get that project completed. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Deputy Mayor Daryl Carey and his portfolio, the Public Works Utilities and Finance, and he'll speak on that right now. Good morning, I'm Daryl Carey, and uh, the chair of Public Works. 
and finally, <coughs> uh, first of all, the questions we have, are, are we, the questions that were emailed to us, are we, are you bring the question up and we're going to answer, or how are we doing that part? No, you can just, uh, a lot of the questions will end, hopefully in your presentation, there could be some of the questions answered in your oh, okay. presentation. Uh, the Public Works Department consists of uh, three full-time um, staff, uh, six to eight part-time, and then we have on the sewer water division one full-time and one part-time. Um, they all do a great job of maintaining our infrastructure, uh, the roads, the grass, and the, our equipment, and um, the town is looking as, uh, mm -hmm. I think, as beautiful as ever. Um, <coughs> the, just some of the expenses we have on point you might not be aware of, like stuff like dust control uh, this year, that might have been around $55,000 dust off the roads. Um, we purchased a, a Kubota skid steer this year. Um, we traded in a, a Kubota sweeper. We bought a new backhoe last year. Uh, we have three main pieces besides our trucks and our mower, mowers and all that. We have a, a backhoe, uh, a grader, and, and the um, backhoe grader and the loader. And they're all uh, in, in really nice shape. And uh, it's, that's an that's a upgrade for the future. Um, Project we have for next year is the paving of Eaton. We have three hundred thousand dollars allocated in next year's budget to see that job uh, go ahead. It, it's been pushed back a couple of years because other projects have come up and, and funding and stuff. And as Tony mentioned, it's all uh, not we're, we're, we're still seeking dollars to grant money for Eaton, but all the other projects uh, were usually a lot of times able to do them earlier because of the funding of fifty percent from the province. Uh, one example, even our, uh, a couple of uh, big expenses coming up is uh, some sl sludge removal. And I believe that's is a couple hundred thousand. Like, and, and we got matching funds coming for that just to uh, uh, increase our capacity for our, 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 our lagoons. And uh, we have a new well that was uh, just put in, not quite <coughs> finished, but there's some mechanical left. But that was a very costly pro uh, project, and that was also 50% funding. We have a new uh, security gate with a car lock system going in at our plant on, on Kernstead. And that should be any time this fall, I guess, uh, taking place there. Uh, I'm just going to see if there's any other interesting things. We're, we're going to replace them because uh, we're, our plan is to do the Eaton National. We're, we're, we're going to be replacing the sewer valves on Eaton because we don't want to uh, do the asphalt and then, and then uh, after a year later tear it up because of the replacing the valves. So we've been doing that, and, and our manager Tim has been looking after that, uh, replacing the valves and replacing them on Eaton. <coughs> yeah. Let's see, let's just look at some of these questions that came in. But one, I'll just touch on the finance side. Uh, Winnipeg Beach is, is in, uh, uh, financially in really good shape for a community our size. It's always a more challenging to have a small tax piece, but we do a very good job of always looking for efficiencies <coughs> and, and uh, scrutinizing the departments to try to say what we can. Um, we have, our reserves are quite healthy. Um, we have three ventures, one on the sewer plant, one on the water plant, and we have one on the, uh, the one on the public works fire fire. And the sewer and water, the venture comes up, it's, it's, it's paid off in about four, four or five years. And I think the public works building uh, the fire hall is, is about 11 years left, 11, 12 years, which will increase our capacity for more for future infrastructure that needs to be addressed. Some of our you know, old sewer lines and water lines, so, stuff like that. Um, ventures. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of questions that came in. We had some questions that came into the office um, on, on some issues. So, one of the questions was what is council going to do about the sidewalk clearance uh, bushes and stuff? Um, this is the, the, the branches and stuff that hangs over the sidewalks in town. Um, like all communities, we all face these issues that, that, that trying to keep them clear so we can use the sidewalk. So it's, it's what we see we, we, we uh, try to fix, but it's mostly complaint driven. So if there's an area where you walk in, it's really bad, just call the office and, and we'll make sure that we, we contact the owner and, and have that clear. Uh, another question was just going on the list here. What are you going to be paid? Okay, that's a good answer. Can you enlighten me on where the bricks? That were damaged on the boardwalk went. The people only get a chance to have them and who received the bricks. We uh, have, you know, damaged bricks and 
and some that were faded for whatever issues with them. But we repurposed them and we use them for little projects around town. Um, another question, what is the status of the water and sewer system? Well, we have a, a major water upgrade a couple years ago and we have a new sewer system. So they're both uh, running, there's all good work and, and maintenance to be doing and our managers doing a great job attending to those. And uh, Barry might have something to add to, to that um, the system to solve it. That's, they're functioning and working and the, um, I don't know if that's what they want to hear, what the actual question was. And then it says about the third well, we have a third well we drill. I, 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 it's not in function right now, so we, we have three wells. And we've been switching all, all the first two back and forth, you know, utilizing both. And, and I think one is one of the primary used to pump, fill the trucks now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Yeah. one of the wells there. So, um, and that's about the third well. But fire hydrants, we have some lower pressure on fire hydrants, but. Um, I'm not sure exactly how this is addressing it, should, should help it, but we only have five in, in the downtown area and in the park. It's not through the town or anything, so uh, we have a, a, a large water supply in that too for our safety. Uh, I'm just going to see if there's anything else to mention. Oh, I think that's the, the conclusion of my report, and thank you. Okay. I, I would just like to uh, elaborate a little bit on a couple of items that, uh, that Councillor Kerry had brought up. One of the things, uh, one of the questions was something uh, I know last year we received a question with or a concern about not having the boardwalk lights on year round and why that was. Uh, the provincial park controls all the lighting in, in the park. And they had felt in the winter time because of traffic, because of the pedestrian traffic flow and that, and to save on money or energy that they shut the, the, the switch off and uh, they did not uh, have the lights on. When we, got, uh, when we got that, we approached the province and t spoke with them and we said, okay, uh, what can we do? How can we work this out? If we uh, get the lights out, our community is, uh, we're getting a lot of more active, cross country skiing and walking. Uh, so we approached them and we were able to work out or negotiate a deal with them that uh, at our cost though, so the, we pay for the hydro usage of those lights during the winter months. So we thought that that was kind of a, you know, they take care of the summer because the summer months are of course, uh, <coughs> they have a shorter one. So in the winter months, those lights will be on. And as far as I understand, that isn't changing this year. So those, those lights will be on. With regards to the well itself we have three wells that we put in we have had those wells are fairly old we have had some upgrade on the older two wells and with upgrades on some of the pumps in previous years we felt it was vitally important if we're getting government funding that we utilize that funding to improve our water system and in that system was also um, the flow rates of our systems for what we call the quick flow to fill up the fire trucks and stuff and we found that there was an issue with it and we wanted to make sure that we have a brand new well to supply water, safe water to the community. So 50 cent dollars, we got it for half the price. So we thought it was a great deal to, to do this kind of work right up front. There was also another grant, which was the, uh, are, are you gonna be talking about this beer or am I stealing your thunder? I think I'm stealing your thunder. Well, you did it to me. So I know. <laughs> The other one is our, is our sewer pumps. Our sewer pumps are from our lift stations were very, very old. We're trying to upgrade our system. And again, we, Council had an opportunity with the Water Services Board to upgrade our sewer pump or our lift station pumps because they were really old and we probably won't be able to get parts or anything like that. So we invested in upgrading the two sewer pumps or lift station pumps. The other thing is that, that, uh, that Daryl also talked about was uh, our other infrastructure that we're having like curb stops and stuff like that. What we found, what we found is that it's sometimes difficult to know if your pump is working properly and the curb stops is working properly. Because if, uh, if your curb stop and your pump is, if your curb stop's not working, 
and your pump is working, the water will be pumping out all the time. The only time we notice that there's a problem, and you might have noticed this this year, Manitoba Hydro was working on all the lines throughout Manitoba, or throughout Winnipeg Beach. Power was shut off. So what happened in a lot of these, well, in quite a few places, what happened was we found that people's check valve, that's the valve that prevents the sewer water from, your, from the town to seep back into the tank. We found that that wasn't working properly. So what happens is your septic tank fills up with sewer and overflows. The town goes off and turns what we call the curb stop off, which shuts the valve that prevents the water or the sewage to come back into your tank. What we found in that situation, there were valves that were broken. So we had to go in and replace it to make sure it was safe, that we had control. So those are the kind of things that you don't know about until it happens. And, you know, unfortunately, it all happened this year with the power outage. So a lot of people had uh, problems with the check valve. We have programs in place that we're checking. When you get a pump out, they're checking your tanks and they want to make sure that those things are operating properly. So if there's an issue with your tank, you could be notified that there's a problem with your tank and that you should maybe look into that. And that's also an environmental concern that the province wants us to enforce. So just preparing you guys, if there's letters that come out that says you, got, you may have a problem with your holding tank, I want you to be aware that that could be a cost that you could incur, okay? I think uh, the valve stems that Daryl was talking about on, on Eaton, I know we've been talking about paving Eaton for a couple of years, but again, we did not realize that we had those curb stops on Eaton. They were under, uh, they were under the ground, and we have to go out and test all of them. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, quite, uh, most of them were in good shape and we didn't have to replace them. So there's some savings there. And again, we're committed to looking at doing Eaton uh, next year. We've been working on it. The one stop was the ensuring that the valves were, were working. I think we got two left to complete. And then by next year, and in fact, I've asked Kerry to, uh, to put it in our committee of a whole meeting agenda, uh, a discussion on getting close to do that project and to do, uh, and to do uh, the sidewalk as well. So. Now I'd like to introduce our counselor, Larry Banks, Protective Services, Environment, and Public Health. I hope I didn't steal any thunder. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry Banks. Uh, I'm going to touch on a, a few things, such as fireworks, bylaw officer, uh, speed limits. Uh, I'm going to talk about the clinic and the fire department. And uh, I'll, I'll try and explain the best that I can here. Um, Upon becoming a, a counselor two years ago, uh, one of the major complaints was fireworks. And uh, so we had uh, numerous meetings about that, and we found that we would change the, the bylaw to address that issue. And um, after implementing that, uh, the, uh, the complaints for fireworks and everything had decreased dramatically. Uh, it was a good thing. We know that there were some people that uh, were concerned about it and would like to have them at, at certain occasions and we did get a request here uh, with con the council consider having fireworks uh, and that is something we will take to the agenda at a future meeting and talk about that um, bylaw officer uh, people have been concerned about uh, the hours how it works with them how do we come up with his hours and things of that nature uh, the by bylaw officer right now has been moved up to 15 hours per week from 11 <coughs> Um, his hours are, are they're flexible, so uh, he may work more on a weekend, like a Saturday night, Friday night, what have you, than he would on a Monday night. So it, 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 it basically goes on events, uh, complaints, and just straight visibility, and that's how we try to move him around. We had some issues at the, uh, the fire hall, so we increased his hours a bit more to start <coughs> patrolling that area and uh, make sure that nobody was drinking and things like that on the piers. Um, so, and what we do is we take a look at the, uh, we, we monitor the, the bylaw officer on a regular basis. Uh, we, we sit with the CAO and we talk about different things and uh, uh, it, it works pretty good. We can move him around, he's very good at doing that and he'll even, uh, you know, take animals, bring them in, 
I don't know how many straight cats it, it was this year. I had those numbers. I should have shared them with you. But uh, he, he does a lot there. And, and Carrie, our, our CEO, CAO, really works closely with him. Every year we sit together and we, we budget what we feel we should have for hours for it. So that's how we come up with the hours that we will allocate to the bylaw officer. Um, I went right off everything here. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, our bylaw officer has responded to 215 calls since April of this year. Uh, that's about 40, 40 calls a month, average of 1.33 or something per day. Uh, uh, council now is, we're talking about enforcing more laws. So when we talk about uh, things like parking issues, such as uh, misuse of handicapped parking, uh, parking too close to the railway tracks, that was a big, big issue this year. Uh, two hour parking zones, things like that. We're gonna get stricter on that. So council will be uh, talking about that. We have started our talks on it and we're gonna continue to enforce that. Um, another issue that we have, uh, stricter enforcement coming into is the overgrown brushes and trees and stuff that go on to, uh, that approach onto our sidewalks and stuff like that. That has been something that's been going on for years. We've talked about it, really hasn't been enforced that well. Uh, Public Works format, format and his crews as they, they go down the streets and stuff will be sharing that information with uh, Carrie and Carrie, Carrie will share that with the bylaw officer to try and uh, enforce that a lot more. The, there, will, there will be probably fines and stuff that are involved in that after first notices and things of that nature. So we are going to really look at that. We want to make sure that the sidewalks are clear so people can walk without being infested with mosquitoes and getting scratched up, things of that nature. So we are really going to look at that. Um, uh, we are having some issues uh, come and go with uh, unlicensed off-road vehicles. Uh, that thing's been happening for many years and, and some people really, really abuse that. Uh, that is an RCMP issue because the roads are um, uh, in the, their uh, provincial highways, so there's only so much we can do. The RCMP have to get involved with it. Our bylaw officer does try to find out who the offender is, and we make note of that. We share that information with the RCMP. So it's something that we look at, but we, we're, our hands are kind of tied to what we can do with that. So we encourage the... the the people to call the RCMP if they see somebody driving recklessly on an ATV down the street and things of that nature. So uh, we have to work together on that. And the RCMP, um, we will sit down, have our meetings, and we'll tell them what, what's happening, and they will look at different areas if it's for speeding or for violations like that. Um, speed limits. Well, that's another big one. Our last forum we had, we talked about speed limits on Highway 9. And uh, just to refresh some, some people's uh, memories on that, the, the speeds were a lot lower. Uh, the council at that time approved that the speeds could be raised to what they are today. Uh, well, since that time, the taxpayers wanted those uh, speeds reduced. And I'll tell you, it's been painful for us to try and get anywhere with the provincial government. They have to do studies, and I think uh, carrie has been in touch with them. The CAOs prior to Kerry have been in touch with them. Uh, they do some kind of study, and then they, they'll come back and say yay or nay. So we are waiting for a study right now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so what that is, we want to go back to the old speed limits on number nine. We've also talked about crosswalks. Is that something that um, they would consider as well? So that would take a lot more uh, thought as to if they were to approve that work and all that kind of stuff. So it's, but we have put it in there. Um, then we talk about 229. We have uh, the speed limits coming from 90 on the highway and it reduces down to 50 right away. It really doesn't give you a fair amount of time to gradually slow down. We felt it would be better to go from 90 to 70 to 50. Uh, there's lots of families there with little children, carriages and stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's a terrible, uh, terrible sight. If an accident can happen so easily. So we, we feel very strong with that. We're in talks with highways on that. And then we went as far as buying a little reader sign. Um, it wasn't a lot of money. We bought it at uh, the AMM convention. We thought it was a, a great device that we, we could post. And, and, and we got three locations that we used. We used uh, uh, on 229, we tried it. And we hold it there for three months and try and collect data. This data we can share with the RCMP if we see spikes at certain times with people speeding. 
Uh, we, we can use it for our own personal things, and we can also use it for plywood to build our case with them. The, uh, we have one unit with three brackets, I think, right now. We share that bracket on um, number nine highway and also at the school. On so, uh, like I say, it stays for three months and it moves around and we collect the data that way. Um, and it was quite interesting, the data that we have found just by using it on 229, and now we're waiting for the school and then it moves on again. Um, it's a good tool for us. And I think the sign itself, by just being up there and, and blinking away that people know that they are speeding, will reduce the speed to, with some people. Not everybody, but some people. Um, we, we also have a new clinic in town. I, I'm sure everybody's aware of that. We have a nurse practitioner uh, that works uh, uh, how many days? Uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 9.30 to 3.30. And the office is always open uh, during the week, the five days a week, uh, taking appointments. And you have to have appointments because of COVID, for sure. Uh, so that's been new to us, and we're excited about having that. Um, fire department tell you a bit about the fire department. Uh, right now we have 16 active members. 11 of those members have their level one certification. Uh, level one focuses on the firefighting basics, and everything you need to know uh, to go into a burning structure. Firefighter survival, search, rescue, ropes, knots, fire behavior, ventilation, uh, SCAB, SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, and personal protection equipment water supply and cold weather fighting. And that's just something I wanted everybody to be aware of. It's, it's, it's interesting what we have in our own backyard there. These firefighters are really uh, training and, 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 and they, they also do training exercises every second Sunday, every second Tuesday. Uh, and these may be uh, where they take a Hercules pump and they pump from the lake and they test it, all their equipment and see how, how it is to, to put out a fire like that. They do uh, uh, fire burns on cars, on houses, and those are uh, exercises that are done on Highway 229. I don't know if you know that we do have a little piece of property there that we uh, share with Public Works, and the fire department uses it for, uh, they have a sea can there so they can have a, an exercise like it's a house burning down. You know, uh, They have cars there where they have to use the jaws of life on. Um, and the Public Works foreman and the fire chief are gonna get together to look at enhancing that a bit so it looks a bit more beautiful rather than seeing burnt cars and things like that. So, so we are going to focus on that, put a new gate, uh, clean it up a bit. Um, uh, we have five members that are attending the next level one course in the department and they, that will be, they will be teaching it right here. Uh, one member has a level two certification, level two builds on level one training and includes uh, flammable liquids, flammable gas fires, <coughs> suspicious fires using foam and public education. Seven members are trained in material, hazardous materials. Uh, five members trained in vehicle extraction. Um, uh, we are, uh, they are looking at more courses through to, uh, 2022 as well. One member has emergency service instruct instructor level. One member has fire investigation. All members have incident command 100. Uh, this year, they have responded to 20 calls the amount of calls in 2020 was 15, so there's been five more calls since then, since last year. Um, three of the firefighters have traveled to Davidson Lake. Uh, it was a northern fire that just uh, happened recently, uh, and we're very proud of them that, that they put everything aside and did that. Um, they, they assisted the Manitoba Wildland firefighters in the office of the fire commissioner. Um, the members uh, were Andrew Good, uh, Teresa Melanick and Travis Taylor. So I'm, I just like to say thanks, guys. Uh, and so, uh, and then COVID 19 brought new challenges to our fire department. They need to change how they respond to calls to protect themselves and others. Uh, we're working with the OFC, the Officer of the Fire Commission, um, the EMO, Emergency Measures. Uh, new guidelines were put into place for pandemic response. So that was a whole uh, bunch more training again. The department applied for and has received $43,000 from the provincial uh, government through a fire protection grant. Um, the grant is being used to construct a mezzanine in the fire hall, which will be used as a training room. 
so the, the training room me meaning to, to learn these different uh, uh, things, no, not an exercise room, it's a, it's a training room to, to, to learn how to uh, get to different levels and things of that nature. Um, this room will allow the department to efficiently deliver theory instructions, participate in online meetings, trainings, host training courses, mutual aid meetings, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the design of the training room will also allow the town of Winnipeg Beach and emergency measures to utilize as an emergency operations center should the need arise, which we feel is very important. Uh, leaving that, going to environmental, uh, just to share with you that the town of Winnipeg Beach has uh, joined uh, town of Victoria Beach, RM of Alexander, to campaign with, uh, to the AMM uh, to lobby two senior levels of government in implementing a plan of action to dealing with zebra mussels uh, in Lake Winnipeg. We have written a letter of support for this as well. And that's about all I have. Thank you, Larry. We'll wait for the questions at the end, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, just a couple of things, too, I just wanted to bring up. The mezzanine funding was, uh, for the mezzanine area, was 100% funded. So there was no cost uh, for the mezzanine facility uh, for that. Uh, the other thing, too, with regards to zebra mussels, uh, since the uh, zebra mussels were introduced, there hasn't been very much talk about it, and uh, communities are still impacted by it. However, the provincial government, and I'm not sure if you're aware of it, did did purchase uh, pieces of equipment, uh, one for this side of the lake and one for the Grand Beach side of the lake, which is a uh, which is a, I guess a a bee sweeper that picks up the zebra mussels. So they do 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 that along Winnipeg Beach as well. Uh, they also, and within the other areas that they look after, they do use a sweeper for that. Okay, just a little bit of background information on that. The other thing I wanted to point out with the enforcing of bylaws. Enforcing and finding of bylaws is, uh, is, uh, is a very tricky thing because there's protocols that we have to follow. Uh, I'm going to say, let's use uh, grass cutting for example. We get a complaint for grass cutting, we go look at it. We have to send out a registered letter to that person. We have to give them the opportunity for a period of time to have that grass cut. Uh, if they don't, with grass cutting, if they don't, uh, then we can in fact, hi, we have a contractor that will go out there and cut the grass and that homeowner will then be billed for that service. Uh, that's a similar type of thing that we're looking at with, uh, with uh, with the brush clearing, as uh, Larry had mentioned, uh, is something that we're looking at. There has been several letters that were sent out to homeowners to clear their brush, and we've done that before. And brush, of course, grows every year just like grass. So it's important for the individual to do that. We're looking at the best way of implementing a fine or how we can uh, go there and do the trimming because then what happens a lot of times uh, again We've been seeking we have to seek legal advice uh, Because we're cutting somebody's branches and trees down that are overhanging uh, There could be issues with that So we want to make sure that we do that so it's not that We're not concerned about those issues is that we have to follow certain uh, protocols and unfortunately those kind of things take take a long time uh, as you can tell with different programs like Larry had mentioned with the uh, with the province and the speeds and that. We've been fighting this, what, for about four years? Four, well, almost four years now. So, it, unfortunately, you know, with changing government and other things, COVID and everything else, these things have been delayed. So we're always trying to get these things moved along. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Barry Bull. He'll be speaking on recreation. Good morning. Um, I to begin by, you know, Larry, by the way, is very detailed. Um, mine is a little, has a little less detail due to COVID. It's really pretty much, you know, decimated the rec program for the last year. Um, but I will talk about some of the questions that, was, that were brought up with me. Um, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the past before I talk about the future regarding recreation. Um, my role as rec chair and as this council prepares for a new year, I think we need to remember that much has been accomplished um, by many people before us. Uh, Pat Green, for example. I just I want to make mention that, that there's been a lot of dedicated counselors uh, and, and town people that have uh, put a lot into this community. Um, so I want to talk about the future, the future that will be built or we will begin to build. 
for the remainder of this term and into the next election. Uh, before I talk about what we might do as a council, I'd like to talk about how I hope we will do it. Many of you heard me say this before, but it bears repeating, outstanding communities are not built for people, they're built with people. Um, and as recreation, I believe community involvement is, is utmost importance with, with community uh, recreation and the community center itself. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Daryl and Daryl asked me about the fire hydrants. We have 24 fire hydrants and about 65 uh, water valves uh, with utility. 12 of the 24 fire hydrants are now 50 plus years old. Uh, that being said, um, most likely will need to be replaced with a cost of 12 to $15,000 per, per hydrant. Again, that's estimated. Um, <coughs> I would like to outline some of what I personally like to see taking place over the next few years uh, and where I believe some of our efforts must be placed. As Chair of Recreation and Co-Chair of Public Works, I want to share where we are currently and where I'd like to see Recreation head. My priority is to ensure our Rec Director and his team have the tools required, uh, clear direction from Council, and community involvement to make our Recreation programs as successful as they can be. Uh, we need to stop doing things the same we always have and start moving forward. So my plan is putting together a community-based recreation committee uh, for the community centre and other area-based activities. To me that's very important. We need community input. We have to have that. Um, we need to think about other recreational amenities such as the idea of an all-season complex, uh, which sport groups and the residents have supported. Uh, currently we have Babs and Pickleball, the So Happy Arts Club, and in the past few weeks, the Breast Cancer Ride, uh, the Show and Shine, and the amazing bandstand that really brings our community together. Uh, we also must move forward on the fitness center. Uh, it's a must have for this community. Uh, we simply cannot sacrifice uh, one sport for another. So when I talk about the multi-complex, um, and I want to repeat that, we cannot sacrifice one <coughs> sport for another. Um, we need to accommodate all of us, and, and that's really big on, on, on my plan, and I hope all of councils as well. Uh, I know it won't be easy, but I think with proper planning, proper budgeting, and forward thinking, this will happen. Um, that said, we will have ice for the upcoming season. The ice with the plant repairs are near completion, uh, and we are in the discussion stages of finding a way to accommodate all recreation activities for everyone. You know, I, I look around and I do see uh, people who have a track record of participating <clears throat> in community building, volunteering, and helping others in need. And, and again, this, this really needs to happen to, to make our recreation program as successful as possible. Um, I have no doubt that, that we will make these things happen. Uh, and remember, this is where Manitoba comes to play. So I, I really encourage people to get involved with the recreation, get a hold of Alan. Uh, if you have questions for Carrie, please get a hold of Carrie because, you know, I, again, I, it's very personal for me. Our recreation, our sports, no matter what the sport is, I, I believe we should all be participating with our community centre. Um, it, it is the hub. I, I truly believe that. It's the hub of our community. Um, so thank you for being here on this important day uh, and embracing our passion, our optimism, and our hope for an even better Winnipeg Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, just uh, there was just the one question with regards to uh, the toboggan slide. Uh, it's something that we had looked, uh, looked at uh, if there was a grant funding available for that, and I think that's something that maybe council will uh, will look and see what kind of funding is available for uh, those kind of things. So, like I had mentioned before, <coughs> our staff, uh, recreation staff, and our CAO, we're always looking at opportunities for any projects that we do that we get 50 cent dollars because we are a small community and we want to stretch our dollars as much as you, as much as we can and everybody around this table here uh, we're all taxpayers and it's our money as well so we really do due diligence on, on opportunities that we can get grants in some cases just so you know some grant opportunities have a very limited application time so we can get notified three weeks from or three weeks uh, prior to the deadline of the date 
and we need to get all this information and sometimes we can't get that information. And that's why it's always important when we're looking at projects, we prepare our projects in case those grants come up, we have all that information ready to go so that if there's a short timeline for applications, we can throw those applications in. So I just wanted you guys That's to be aware. Of deadlines on the ground. Well, uh, deadlines, slow deadlines on the ground. Yeah, and ground. the grant will come in and, and, and you have like two, three weeks in front of this, they'll say you need three quotes for this. You just don't have time to even get all the stuff to get that grant. Uh, often there's more time, but some grants are a very short window. Yeah. Uh, I'd like now to introduce uh, Councillor Jean Genron, Economic Development, Heritage and Tur Tourism, to speak. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I'd like to thank Robert for being generous together for saving the best for last. Um, I am the Chair of Economic Development, Heritage and Tourism, and Councillor Larry Banks is on the committee with me as well. Um, it's only been a short three months, um, which has been very busy, so I do want to thank Larry and Carrie for catching me up to speed on some things so that I could uh, prepare some information for you today. Um, with economic development, we do have a couple of projects in work, in the works that I'd like to update you on. We are in the process of finalizing a development agreement with Dairy Development for a 44 lot housing development called Lakewood Estate that is located at the uh, west end of Lake and Stroll Way. Um, and, the, and then another project that we have, the, um, a three-phase project that is ongoing, with phase one completed. It is a beautification project uh, on the east side of Prospect, uh, running from, it runs parallel to Prospect, and it's running from Spruce uh, on the south, and then running north all the way to the end of the marina at uh, Boundary Creek. Phase one has been completed, which was the laying of line, a limestone walking path. Um, we, Phase two is the asphalt to that surface. Um, we had hoped to secure um, some financing for that through a grant. Um, we were not successful in obtaining the cost sharing grant that we'd applied for. So we will continue to pursue grant applications and um, we will look at um, further funding on our end um, on this project when we are reviewing things for our 2022 budget plan. Um, we would like to have that phase of the project tackled at the same time as the phasing of Eaton in order to save some money um, and having the two asphalt projects done at the same time. Um, the town owns a portion of land um, in the park area, which is commonly referred to as postage stamp corner, um, which is at the corner of Prospect and Park. So um, until I was on council, I thought that whole area was provincial park, but there is a piece that we own. So the final phase of this project will involve um, beautification of, the, uh, of that corner with the idea of hopefully making it a meeting place uh, for members of the public to enjoy. Um, in order to support large-scale large economic development, the first thing we need to ensure is that we have infra infrastructure in place to support that. Um, Tony mentioned that our infrastructure is aging, and we are certainly looking at um, um, improving on our sewer infrastructure. Um, currently, um, with the, some of the work that's being done, we are able to meet the, the um, need for the um, dairy development Lakewood Estate. Um, however, we will need to uh, continue to improve on our, our uh, sewage infrastructure in order to be able to look at any future long-term large development plans. Or another option that uh, we could be looking at is if there is an investor who is looking at a large development plan, that they would have to um, invest in the infrastructure in order to support the development. We're very fortunate that our new CAO has a very strong economic development background. Um, so I'm certainly looking forward to working with Terry um, leading up to our budget meeting um, and as a council being able to have some uh, strong, serious discussions on some long-term economic development plans for the community. Terry Farrell's background will certainly help steer those conversations. Um, under culture and heritage, we have a number of heritage plots around town um, that um, are placed to highlight historical events, things, people involved in our community, things such as Eddie Walker's Corner, uh, William White, um, there's a plaque uh, um, with the history on Boundary Creek, and, and there's also um, one at the Artesian Mall at Laurel and Grove. They have certainly started to show their age. 
Um, so public works are in the process of removing and all of these, taking them indoors and refurbishing them. And then once refurbished, they will be on a sort of a, a rotational inspection basis so that we're able to maintain them at, a, at, at the level that they will be at when they're um, put out after being refurbished. And the last thing I want to talk about is tourism. We all know it was a very difficult 2020 uh, and start to 2021 summer season, but we were finally able to see COVID restrictions change, which allowed the return of activities to the bandstand. We saw the return of free fitness Saturday bands on the bandstand, two very successful outdoor vendor markets, and our Manitoba 150 celebration a year late, and our Canada Day celebrations in September. And both of these included spectacular firework displays. Um, my compliments to um, Alan and Arthur, uh, re the recreation team, who were trying, Alan was trying to stay on top of things every time there was a new announcement, and the fact that they were able to pull off all of this with um, very short notice to the change in um, the COVID rules is certainly um, uh, kudos to both of them for um, the hard work that they did and the community uh, support and the crowd that they drew, clearly people were missing these things. Um, as well, we had a very successful uh, car show last weekend that saw oh, about 400 cars uh, in the community. It was at the registration table and a lot of the car owners were just so excited to finally be able to get out and show off um, show off their cars, meet with people that they normally spend a fair bit of their summer time with. So again, it was a huge success. Um, one of the biggest boosts for tourism in Winnipeg Beach this past year has been the opening of the Rose Beach House. I had the opportunity to tour it with the owners just after she opened earlier this summer. It's uh, inspired by 1960s California, and there are five sweet retro chic motels located across from the beach boardwalk. Within hours of opening, their online reservations were completely booked for the summer season, clearly an indication of the need for accommodations in our community. And the Rosie Beach House um, actually provides year-round accommodations to visitors to Winnipeg Beach. So um, we're, we're very happy to have them in the community and certainly filling a need that I think has been discussed or raised um, quite often at these forums as, as a need for uh, short-term accommodations. Thank you all very much for coming out. Um, community engagement is something that is important to me and that I value in um, my role as a counselor so that I can certainly um, know what's important to members of the community and help address them. So thank you for giving us your Saturday morning for us. Thank you, Jean. I uh, just, uh, just want to elaborate on two, two points, sorry. Uh, two points. One is, uh, again, our infrastructure, how vitally important our infrastructure is and ensuring that our infrastructure is working properly in order to accommodate further development. Further development, what happens is we get more revenue from, our, from the tax base, and that's the intent so that we keep the community going. Uh, we were very fortunate, again, with, uh, with monies uh, that we were received. We were able to scope out the entire, uh, what we call the gravity system, the downtown system. Uh, we were able to scope out and see what kind of damage or maybe collapsion that may have occurred in those lines. Again, those lines are, are extremely old uh, and we were very fortunate. Uh, we had the video and we were able to look at the video. We, there, we were able to identify two locations where that we had a bit of a problem that we are uh, undertaking to repair and have our gravity system working properly. So you'll probably see a little bit of construction one was uh, around the fire hall area, another one was in, around the park area uh, with our main sewer lines that we're looking at and we want to improve. And again, funding from the federal government or the provincial government really helps with those things. And this is the time you want to do those kind of works is when you got those 50 cent dollars because it's a lot cheaper for all of us. Uh, the other thing I just wanted, and one of the questions that came up here, two questions that, uh, that was, were my questions, one was, with economic development is one is are we uh, are we talking or, or are we looking at improving Robinson Avenue our Main Street basically area uh, just so you know we've had just a, a preliminary discussion on what our vision is for the front street as you know we've had we've had those uh, 
of those uh, black uh, barricades there on the ground. And we've had the, we've had the uh, last, the year before we had the, uh, the boardwalk, the wooden boardwalk. We want to look at more of a permanent solution and council will be going into further discussion on what maybe the vision could be for that front street and how we can avoid those kind of things and maybe look at an extension of the sidewalk. But again, uh, we're looking at getting professional help to give us an idea of what, what kind of look that we want for the downtown area and the expenses involved in that. So that, and that's one thing that we're doing. A person had asked a, a question with regards to the cement pad in the provincial park near the water tower. That is the provincial park's property. That used to be a restaurant and that used to be other things in there. Their, uh, that's their path. Uh, I know at one time they were talking of putting up a, uh, um, a picnic structure up there. So again, it's up to them. It's, we have no real say unless they come to us and ask us what they'd like to see there. So uh, again, it's, it was a picnic shelter that they uh, were looking at. And I think that's something that would be really good for that section as well. Okay, on that note, I've talked a lot. I'm going to leave it up to you guys now for some questions and answer. Uh, I have that gentleman at the back there first. Yeah, actually, I was just kind of if, wondering what the uh, forum call was for asking questions. Uh, yeah, if you could give us your name and your address. Uh, Jan Schenkel, I've been uh, at 510 Park for approximately uh, eight years now, part-time resident. This year, we're actually making the turn to full-time. Okay. So I live on 229, and uh, I know what the issues are there. Like, I would debate the effectiveness of that sign, that little blinking sign that you had. I was, I was going to ask if there is any data collected. I would love to see it. Because in my mind, it's basically out of control. Yeah. It is. Like, let's be honest about it. If anybody would, anybody on council would love to come sit on my front step for a few hours and just watch it. It is maddening. Uh, you did mention to uh, perhaps call the RCMP. I had them on speed dial. Just, you know, speed around park, speed around park, speed around park. There is no, uh, there is no satisfaction in that. And in, uh, I can recall at least three times in the time that I've been there where I've seen RCMP vehicles not adhering to the speed limit. You know, no lights, no signs. They're just cruising into the stop sign on that. You know, so you're basically peeing against the wind when you call that, in my opinion. So, we'll let so uh, uh, what else did I want to say? Uh, the speed limit being raised on 9. Mm -hmm. I was at the last town forum where they said the uh, highways approached Winnipeg Beach and Correct. asked if they could increase. Yes. So that was a Winnipeg Beach decision to allow it. That, that was based on a recommendation from the, that was based on a recommendation from the province on their study that they had done. And they had looked at the whole study. Uh, right all the way to Gimli on that study, and that was a council decision at that time uh, based on their report to us. On their report? Right? Yes. Now, wouldn't you want to sort of make it a town decision? I realize you've got to be elected official on another yeah. because I'll just step back and say, I want to thank you guys for stepping up and being leaders in the mm -hmm. community. It takes a lot of balls, and well, excuse my French, but to do that and put yourself out there, so thank you for that, but you also are the representatives and the people that we come to. So. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And I, what I can tell you is that, you know, sometimes the decisions we make, uh, we look at decisions that, when we make a decision, we always try to keep in mind uh, the benefit for the town and so forth. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Yeah. Sometimes we make a mistake. And as you can see, we're trying to correct that mistake. Yeah. And, and that's what we do, you know. Uh, We've admit to the mistake that, you know what, there is a concern and maybe we should have looked at a different approach. So for that, I apologize for that kind of thing, but we have been trying to work with the province and trying to get that resolved. Yeah, it's hard to go back, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, uh, it's, but, it's 70, you might as well call it 70. But Larry, Larry can, uh, Councilor Larry Banks can, can comment on what we're doing with the data, right. if you want, Larry. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. the, the data collected, we want to share that with the RCMP. We want to show them, say, this is the proof, this is what's going on, and we need you to be there at these times. Okay, so we'll, we may see, um, see, we can break it down per day. So Friday at, at 6 to 7 o'clock, we get lots of tra uh, 
travel down there at high speed. Yeah. One of the things we haven't done is, uh, and I want to kind of look at it, is going west. I'd like to get those speeds because I, what I understand is that if you're getting oh. gravel trucks and everything that are speeding, heading out of Winnipeg Beach. Oh, yeah. I can hear the accelerating. Yes. You know, I live in between four ways rolling. Yeah. I can hear the accelerating at the tracks. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They're, they're I, 80 kilometers an hour heading out, right? That's. It's, uh, it, it's, it's bad and, and it's painful having to deal with the provincial government this way. And if there's anything we can do to, to fast track this, we definitely will do it. I, 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 for a living, I, draw, I uh, drive a school bus and I drop the kids off on 229. And it, it, it terrifies me to, to have a, a child walk across that street. Yeah. You know, because uh, these people are barreling along. They see the yellow lights and they ain't slowing down. You know, so we keep the kids locked in there until the car comes to a complete stop because even if they're just rolling a bit, they may just go through it. And people have done that. They just slow down but just roll through. When these kids cross the front, they don't look. I've slowed down to pull into my driveway and I've had people pass me on the gravel. Yeah. And pull around and, and yeah. Okay, we're, we're, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to, uh, I think we've kind of answered your questions. Uh, so we're going to. More. Just want to add one thing to that. Okay. Uh, I just want to let you know we have over the years several times asked the RCP to separate earlier, and I've never seen it. Yeah. So yeah. You mentioned you were thinking of maybe staging down the speed, speed limit at 90, 70, 50. Yeah. Now, will the speed limit remain 50 within Winnipeg Beach? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 This, this would be an addition to. So perhaps maybe that 90 could start at Mackenzie Road, and then the 70 comes in to to have them gradually slow down. My last thing will say, you know, there's a sign, who doesn't know it's a 50 kilometer hour zone? You take your foot off of the accelerator, yep. you coast down to 50, and then you continue down. Yeah, but it's, people aren't doing it. Yeah. It's, yeah. I can tell you that, again, the council is well aware, and, and we have been working so hard trying to get this done. Yeah. And that's why we got the sign, so that we can prove to the province and prove to the RCMP. We can we can pick up we can pick up the the times and dates and have the RCMP it's, it's, designate their times to that. So thank you very much. I have a question right here. The question was for that. I'm at two forty five older, so I'm three off the highway. You talk about a traffic study. Is it started, or the traffic study has been started? No, it, it has been started. In fact, we did receive an email uh, with regards to that, and I know Carrie has responded to that. Maybe you can just... Yeah, the province has uh, done numerous studies over the last 10 years, and the data comes back the same all the time. So what they're sharing with me is the accumulation of data they have, and then we're going to do the analytics on it, and then we'll provide a report back to them on what our recommendations are. So far, what they do with their studies is they make their own recommendations, the advice I've been given from the province is perhaps our council now can look at that data cumulatively and then come back with our proposal on what we would like to see. And it's the first time they've asked us to do that, so I think it's a positive. And morally, we can only recommend, we can't, they have the final say what they determine the speed is. We can make recommendations and stuff, but we don't have the power to think that. Okay, is there anything the community can do to help your cause? When it comes to things like that, I'm not talking about, you know, doing big rallies or anything, but can you get any action by getting us involved? Well, uh, talking to the local MLAs and that kind of stuff, highway traffic, highway traffic people and that, uh, I'm, I'm calling them and say, look, we've got a problem here, if more phone calls go to them, uh, you know, they're going to, they might turn around and say again, uh, you got to talk to the town about that, but in reality, if they get the complaints to their office, then you know they know that people are really concerned about it. And we've tried, like I said, we've been at it for four years at it. And I have one more question just sure. for direction. You've got a beach that was just all redone, and it's all full of rocks. And I followed my direction to call. I called federal government. I called provincial, and all you and the town who said it's not their responsibility. It's province. Yeah. And the province has literally turned around and said, good luck if you think you can get anything done with getting these rocks removed. And I've literally witnessed it every single day. There's nobody at that new beach because of all the rocks in the water. Is the way to do something and deal with the province or to come to you to work together? Because me, as a citizen, I'm, I'm getting old. 
You're talking that beach closer to Ash Avenue, right? In between Ash yeah. and the, and the, the main uh, beach. bathroom, yeah. right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It's literally such a waste of all the money they put into that. Yeah. And they did it. They did expand. They did expand that beach, made it uh, made it bigger. In fact, all the dirt that they used from that, they built up the uh, soccer fields and that. That's where they and used that. And nobody swims there. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Okay. So that's yeah. my question. Should I call you and the CEO? I, I I think we have it, and I think what we'll do as a council too is maybe look at uh, asking a uh, uh, asking the province and. and Again, for, for maybe something to get sorted out, and even those groins that are on action, those areas too, those rocks have mm -hmm. tilted down, and maybe they can, at this point in time, because it's so low, maybe there's an opportunity that they can do that. Again, a lot of times what happens is uh, uh, they have X amount of dollars as well, mm -hmm. and what it will sometimes take is a joint cooperation with the town in that. Mm -hmm. So again, what happens with that and, and where we get some of the concerns is that it's a provincial piece of property. They're not maintaining and now the town steps in and using their assets and using their funding to help something like that. So those are the fine lines that we have to, we have to sit on sometimes is the cooperation between us and them. And, uh, and, and again, you get two sides of the story where it's a provincial asset and the province should be doing, why should the taxpayers of Winnipeg Beach uh, be doing that, you know. So those are the kinds of things that we have to keep in mind. One over here. Oh, okay. Hi, Chris on Beauregard on oh, yeah. Yeah. Road. Um, what about derelict vehicles? There's a, a couple parked on on a Larch that have been there for two years on the boulevard, and they sit there and they don't move. They never move. Uh, even people's trailers are sitting on boulevards for years. So I'm just wondering if anybody else is complaining about that. Have you put that to the town office? Like, uh, I think so. The locations? Uh, with the vehicles, if I may, with vehicles, what happens with vehicles? If a, we have a definition of a derelict vehicle in our bylaws. Uh, now, the, in our bylaws, you could cover a vehicle. Let's say they have an old, old vehicle that they're working on. They're supposed to be covered with a tarp. Uh, now, other things are that puts a, a wrinkle into things. If it's insured, or even has, even has storage insurance, unfortunately, we can't deem that as a derelict vehicle because there's insurance on that kind of stuff. So that's what happens is that when we get a report, we go take a look at it. And if they turn around and, and provide us proof that they have insurance on it, it it's not deemed. But if they're physically, you know, the car is up, the wheels are off, the bumpers are off, those kind of things, uh, that we can then look at as a derelict type vehicle. Or, or if it's on the boulevard, they can't have it. Can't have it on the boulevard. So uh, um, you said Larch Avenue? Mm -hmm. And which other one was it? Uh, well, there's a couple of trailers parked also on that, on that same street. On Larch, okay. Okay, we'll mark that down and get our bylaw to look at it. At the back there, sir. Hi, Tony. Ken Hi. Chanowski, uh, 650 Park. Uh, that street sign, I see what the group is going here, uh, it's right in front of my place. Yeah. And uh, when it first came up in that, I, I did notice a lot of cars. It was all of a sudden slamming on the brakes because it starts flashing, right? And uh, plus the fact, I guess, when I parked in my driveway, it looks like I could be a hidden car in the bushes, eh? So, but then it does, I don't know, once they get past my place and, and they slow down, all of a sudden they're gaining speed again, by the time they get to number nine. They get about yeah. 50, they're at least maybe 70, 75, yeah. 65, whatever. Right? <coughs> and, uh, but the biggest disheartening thing is I've seen the RCM people flying through there too, yes. And I've even, they've looked at me, and I'm like, this as they go by. And uh, the trucks, half the trucks come through. They're big vehicles, you know, that can do a lot more damage than a car. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tractor trailer trucks coming through with their jake break. Like that is, alone is not, you can't do that in town limits. Yeah. So on the speed side, I can say it does help, right? But I noticed it was gone the weekend before the long weekend. It should have been there, especially mm -hmm. like with all the entertainment on the stage and stuff like that. Like, uh, the last 
traffic. It, it would have been nice to see it yeah. stay up for that weekend. Uh, secondly, derelict vehicles. I've noticed they said Eddie Walker Corner's got a nice black and that with a house on the corner. There's got derelict cars that have been sitting in their front yard for years and years and years. Why? Uh, I got a letter a few years back uh, on site premises because my field wasn't cut. <coughs> that was property behind me, which I don't own anymore. Uh, apparently, for some reason, Steinbeck bought it. Now, he cut it twice in all those years that he purchased that property mm -hmm. from the town. Like, if you got a bylaw constable, I got a letter, I'm sure this guy should have got one of those derelict vehicles. So <coughs> It, that should have come about too. Oh, kudos to the mayor and the councillors for an excellent job working through this COVID and having the entertainment with the stable stuff and other Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, just uh, what we'll do again. Uh, I know what we've done in the past is we've sent some letters in the past to uh, the different uh, companies that, uh, gravel companies and that to ask them that they watch their streets as they're coming in through town. So we have done that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. We have to ask the RCMP why we refuse to set up a radar. Yeah. We're still having problems. So. Yeah, because the RCMP did visit with us. Yeah. And they were more than willing to take the data <coughs> that we collect from those. <coughs> so I'm yeah. not sure if, we, if they've actually received any. Yes, they have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the RCP did receive our data. Their problem is, is again, that's why we needed this, and this is also for highways, so that they can see the, the difference. All we can do is, you know, at X month, when it's 50, if they reduce it, it's so hard. You would wish people would take responsibility on their responsibility for themselves and not do that, but, you know, unfortunately that's not happening but what we do is with the data we can we can see trends what times these things are so then they, the RCP can better, better utilize their radar vehicles they know if it's happening between this time they can come there and uh, and uh, do some ticketing that's why we do that's what happens <coughs> so they can use all they want we gotta get there <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. oh, we have 220 hours of gold huh? <laughs> yes, uh, we have a question here. Uh, okay, uh, I think it was you first there. Yes. Well, I'm a, I've been a resident here now five years. What, what's your name? Murphy Pelamonte. Okay. And I live at 533 Old Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, my concern here is since I've been here and I find uh, it's a bit difficult and hard to understand why we don't have more activities for seniors active living. I know uh, there is a lot of government, there's government grants out there. Um, just wondering if they've been applied for. There is also one that I read about last night is called the New Horizons Seniors uh, Funding. <coughs> yes. $5,000 grant that's here for activities for seniors. Um, I'm an advocate for seniors. I feel we should, uh, if you feel as a senior you want to be active, it should be promoted should be supported, and uh, it should be made open to the public, that it's all available to them. And I also was wondering, I know they have a great program for seniors in Gimli, but do we all have to go to Gimli? We have a beautiful town here that we could be using. We have a beautiful facility here that we could do a few renovations to, that could be uh, accessible to everybody in the community, and I've noticed since I've been here, actually, in an African in the community, you'd be surprised <coughs> to the people of the city that mm -hmm. come to your campground in the summer, I know it's a rental park, but they come here in the summer, they meet us at this facility, they're very happy, they're contented. Uh, it's something that we have to promote. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the people that's coming out here and going to rental campgrounds, they're not teenagers. There are seniors. Yeah. There are seniors like myself, with probably all of us sitting here right now. And uh, I'm standing here. Cities, <laughs> and yes. So I think we need to promote seniors active living as much as much as possible. And myself, I'm certainly willing to volunteer and do all I possibly can to have that put into place here in our community. I have to work with the counselor to do 
do whatever I have to do, it's, it's a must. Thank you. Barry, did you want to comment? Yeah, and, that, and that's what I, you know, I touched on, is that we sort of got to give uh, our rec director a little more direction. Um, and that's why I like the idea of having a community-based committee to offer up these suggestions and to sort of help our rec director with direction on, on where we need to go. I do agree with you. I think we are lacking. Uh, we are really lacking. Yes, we are lacking. Yeah. We, um, have to, we, have to, we have to be honest about it. We are lacking. Correct. Because at, I, I play pickleball, so I'm not here to advocate for pickleball. I think everybody has a place here in this community. Often pickleball is a sport. Correct. But uh, the thing is, uh, it, it could be like just yesterday when we played four people from another community, with white ball, white ball, whatever. Like I'm new here, I can't pronounce all the names yet. But they came here and joined us yesterday. They were very happy. Yes. Very happy. And it's a great group of people that's here especially after yeah, seniors, and I think we could make this community great for I seniors, and I mean, it's a retirement community. Yeah. So who's coming here? <coughs> it's the seniors. And I agree with you. The committee would be great. As much input as we possibly can have for seniors, I think it would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Just, uh, just a couple of comments with the regards to uh, funding. Yes. Whenever there's an opportunity, our rec, uh, our rec manager, he will look for those fundings and apply for those fundings okay. and try to find some kind of program. Okay. And he's been very, uh, we've been very fortunate that we've had uh, quite a bit of funding that for activities that he was ha has been able to secure. Yeah. Winnipeg Beach does have a seniors uh, organization mm -hmm. and they're usually, they usually meet in, uh, in the Legion okay. as well. They play, they play bridge. Uh, Cribs, uh, they have, uh, it's a nice group in there uh, okay. that they, they do, uh, they do have a, a group here in, uh, in Winnipeg Beach. Is that on the website? Uh, we might want to get that out there for people. Because I don't recall seeing that on the website. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Or maybe it's on the Legion, is it? Uh, it's no, 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 okay, no, well, we can, Jean? Yeah, I just want to make a comment um, with regard to um, grants and funding. Um, I have had some conversations, uh, Carrie was there, Barry, Larry, Alan, and myself, when um, we were discussing things about economic development and recreation. We like to start um, doing some planning ahead of these grants coming out, That's right. prioritizing um, what sort of things we would like, you know, what would get the priority, mm -hmm. so that we're setting Alan best up so that when he does see these grants, He's already prepared and has things that he would like to see done so that he can apply for them instead of him seeing the grant and wondering what we can do. But, I mean, we, how can I put this that I don't want to, you can't, how can I say, you can't have, like, the rec, I don't think it's possible probably that it's one person trying to do multiple tasks. Like, he's one individual, he's got to organize all the, all the recreation, the nine dances and whatever. I mean, and then to apply for those grants on top of that, it's, it's, it's a pile of work. So, I don't know, but one person doing all of that, is a, I know he has an assistant, but still, the, it's, it's, and, you know, people will play something running, and it's, 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 it's quite a heavy work though. That's why, yeah, that's why we talked about as a council, and perhaps getting some community involvement, okay. doing the planning ahead of time, okay. so that when the, it's all laid out and ready to go, and then when a grant comes available, he sees what we've got planned that he can apply, you know, use to apply for that grant. Not him doing all of that work, okay. but us doing the planning, and, and, and you know, and making sure that we have, if there's um, quotes required because there's some uh, building or something required with the project or with the event, all that be laid out in order to make, better support him, in, in being able to apply for the grant. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. You're doing a great job. The gentleman. Yeah, out there. Thank you. The gentleman. Yes, sir. Hi, Mark Zineski. I live on Churchill Road. Okay. Uh, yeah. Two questions. Yeah. Uh, one uh, for Daryl uh, would be, uh, as I understand it, Robinson, you go down the main road in front of the beach, that, and then back up, that's all provincial highway. Correct. Okay. Is there any ongoing talks to get that fixed? What? Because it is really fixed. Like that road is terrible. The Robinson, you know, as it comes up, yeah. especially near the tracks, when you come down and then, you know, the, at the north end of the main street where there's that beach access, there's a huge dip 
in the room. Yeah. Is there any, are we looking at getting that fixed? Yeah, we can, uh, uh, many, just one note, is there any conversation? If we, can, we can actually just call the province provincial road yeah. that piece. Well, the whole, the whole, I had mentioned earlier that uh, we are looking at that whole area there. Yeah. If we're going to do work for our sidewalks and we're going to do works uh, work on that, we want to combine all that work because if you notice down the main street as well, some of the yeah, and, and that's that is a culvert that has collapsed. So what we want to do is we want again we want to best utilize uh, our taxpayers' money. So what we want to do at the same time when we're doing that. Because the road might change a bit, depending if we go and extend sidewalks, for example, uh, the, we will work with the province in order to get that whole thing redone at the same time. Uh, rather than, you know, going out next year or whenever, let's say if we hadn't done it this year, then we decide to do other work, well, that kind of would have been a waste of money kind of thing. Yeah. So we want to make sure we've been better utilized our funding in order to get what we want to get accomplished we there. At that. We, we're having a conversation with that and in fact we, we've talked about you know trying to maybe seeking out uh, seeking out a company that would, would provide us a uh, uh, you know a plan. Environmental. We're trying to yeah. The <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the province will be part of that conversation with us. Wait, and, they, and they've been really, the province just so you know they've been really good when it comes to their roadways and, and doing that. So they've been pretty good with that. My second question is, uh, as you're heading northbound on number nine, and you come up to Kirstead Road, right on the corner of the old golf course, Yes. we have that sign that says, you know, yes. is there any thought of maybe taking that one down, re maybe say place it in, in town, but put up an LED sign? Because people drive by and they have no idea they're in Winnipeg Beach. And the same with coming, uh, going southbound. You have one little sign that says, Winnipeg Beach Business District, but when you, in the summer, right on that corner at um, Domo? where the Domo is, mm -hmm. it's like Mushroom City with all the garage sales and yard sales. And you, you just drive by, you don't see that sign. Yeah. Is there any thought of getting bigger signs so that we, I know you gotta comply with highways that can only be so big and so yeah. bright and everything. Yeah. Bigger but an LED or... sign would be better because then you'd be drawing people in. They start over in Winnipeg Beach, business. not Sandy Hook. Yeah. The business uh, blue would be downtown sign? Yeah. yeah, the blue is the you business. Are to get a bigger sign there? Yeah, that, yeah. Right. I'm saying like... That's something we can look at for sure. Yeah, uh, I'm saying like when you're looking at the grants, right? And maybe you yeah. get signs that says, especially if you get the LED one, or something that's a little bit brighter than that one, the one that's been there for, I don't know, 10, 50 years maybe? Uh, yeah. It's a very nice I, sign, don't get me wrong, but you could also yeah. put that on an LED one. What I can tell you is that, in fact, yeah. in fact, there was a discussion with getting an LED. Probably remember that about uh, maybe six, yeah. seven years ago, when we were looking at getting pricing for that sign, and because of the old sign, we wanted to improve it. When we looked at the cost for the at that time for the LED signs, they were it was extremely expensive to get an LED sign. And, and at council at the time thought they wanted to make it look nicer with uh, you know the, the theme that we have going there. And uh, we got a bid uh, from, uh, from a contractor to do it. And it was a really reasonable cost for us to do it. And that's why we did it at that time. In saying that as well, when we were first looking at the LED signs for the highways, like speed signs, they were very expensive back then too. They were. I think six, seven thousand dollars for one. What we found is the price have dropped down now. So again, it might be something. And again, that piece of property as well is is not our property where it sits. So there could be an opportunity at some point in time to change that. Uh, and again, it's something that council can discuss that, and we can can see what kind of cost we could look at that for LEDs because most communities are in fact going with the LED signs. And that you could program and have different things on there. Yeah, that so, would make us stand yeah. out. Yeah. Because honestly, when you're when you're going <coughs> north towards Gimli, you're you know you get the Nauter, you've got Matlock, yeah. you've got Winnipeg Beach. It's just like and Sandy Hook, and people don't recognize. It. Yeah. This yeah. way, if you would stand out, people yeah. oh, there's Winnipeg Beach. You know. Yes. In Manitoba Place. Yes. You know, and you could also get um, maybe you could get. Um, 
some of the uh, businesses in here to put advertising to help, you know, you run the thing, help the company yeah. bring down the cost to the town. Yeah, and with the LED, it's a, a lot easier to program and have that yeah. kind of information. Yeah, we were, we were exploring uh, signage, digital signage for you know the outside of the community center, the inside of the community center. So we have a good idea right now. Mm -hmm. The signage is substantially cheaper now. Oh yes, of course. Like with all remote capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Uh, Name. Lorraine Andershaw. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm representing the Lakeside Seniors unofficially, but they've had meetings with me. They play cards with on Wednesday at 1 p.m. and Privilege on Monday at 1 p.m. Everyone is welcome to attend. Uh, they are looking for volunteers. This is sort of, they've been operating for years with the same executives, the same volunteers, as you know, in every organization. And they want to step down in the spring. They even asked the Legion to take over the cards, but we have a shortage of volunteers too. So that is something that anyone interested in getting involved, they'd be more than happy to hear from you. Lorraine, would you mind just sending a little note to Carrie on that, okay. just so that we can post it out? And uh, also, as far as the Legion goes, for the rest, we advertise all of our events with the town. They're always notified. Uh, we will be sending them a schedule for the year 2022. We had started our craft sales the second week of September back in 2011, and then the town came in with their town sales in, in uh, 2014. But irregardless, we have, because we're indoors, so we can accommodate a little later in the year, we're going to go to September 24th next year, but we are certainly asking that they don't change their dates and plan yeah. something major on that yeah. date. Yeah, we have to coordinate our dates. Yes, but events, we yeah. have. In the beginning, when we started our sales, the rec center was operated at the, end, the beginning of October, the end of September. So I had gone to the beginning of September to avoid that. So this time when we do it, we want an official letter back from the town. Yeah. City, they will not plan something major that takes all the work yeah. at the same time, Thank especially you. the same time of the event. So anyway, we'll be sending that letter over sometime next week on our schedule of projected because of COVID it's all yeah. projected. But uh, I appreciate what the town does for us uh, greatly. And uh, your volunteers the other day was greatly appreciated. And Thank you very much. Are you ready to make meatballs tomorrow morning? Sure. Tim O'Clock. We're almost running out of time, and I have two people that had their hands up. Uh, yes, the young lady with the black mask. No, not, not the young lady with the blue. I have a question. I think it would be for Larry. He mentioned a crosswalk. Yeah. I'm curious, where would it be considered? And is it, the, is it because it would be, I'm assuming, on number nine, that it would be the crosswalk? It would be highways, so it's not whether we want one or not, whether it's just they would pull one up. Exactly. It's highways. Uh, okay. we, we weren't sure how it would work because crossing, let's say, for example, if you were to cross um, over around the Domo Grip, mm -hmm. for example, where would you walk once you get across the street? Where's the sidewalk? There's, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different things that go into the planning, but we've thrown it out there for the province to see if we could, knowing how slow they work, right. to get the ball rolling. And then once it, if they said yes, then you're stuck with where they decide to put That is, again, because of their study? Yeah, we yeah. would be stuck but the way it is now, they probably wouldn't approve it, because like Larry said, there's nothing to take into the Okay. Society. And then I just have one other mm -hmm. uh, question. Um, I went to the, the dump. They have uh, free compost, mm -hmm. okay? And um, we were just uh, told that uh, they have sifted compost and they have... Dirty compost, I yeah. guess, whatever. <laughs> and he said, because we're from Winnipeg Beach, you can't take the sifted yeah. compost because you didn't pay half the price to have it sifted. I'm just curious um, why they, they pulled out. Is this a lot of money? I, I, I can speak on that. Okay. Yeah, that was something. And in fact, our uh, our contract for the for the uh, for the, the nuisance ground is coming up, and uh, we're going to be in discussion with them. Uh, if it's up in December. Uh, just so you know, the, the cost for having 
utilizing their site is $53,000 a year that we are paying them. Uh, they had proposed, again, I don't understand why, they had proposed that if we wanted the good stuff, we'd have to pay this exorbitant amount of money for the good stuff. Okay. But we didn't, we didn't really feel it was a, we were saddened by that, that they, they would do that. Because we're putting it in there as well. And we're already paying quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit for that nuisance ground. So uh, it's coming up. Uh, we can put in the discussion and see if maybe we can do something. But everything comes at a price. And uh, we have to weigh what the costs are and what the benefits are. So, uh, and we had a question here. This will be our last question. Yes? Uh, thank you. Good morning, Jan. Morgay, uh, I live on 7th Avenue, and I've just moved here one year and one month ago. Oh, good. I'm really enjoying uh, my time here at Beach. Great. And a comment about uh, garbage. Yes. Um, I observed over the summer, and we had a very hot summer, but um, the young ladies that I observed multiple times jumping down off of the truck and hauling in the garbage, they didn't have uh, decent boots, they did not have gloves. And, you know, they would be wearing tank tops or something, no marked vests. I just wondered uh, if that was the norm or if they're, they're outfitted. The other thing I noticed was that right behind my home, they uh, did the compacting thing. And I watched this garbage and whatnot dripping out of the bottom. So they didn't come to shovel it, scoop it back in. There was uh, liquid waste and there was broken glass that pushed through that. So I just wanted to know if that was something that is within your control. Uh, just and, and again, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, listen to uh, what this community is all about. I'm loving it. Great. Uh, just uh, just on that, if I may, uh, it's the uh, the garbage uh, contract is bitted out. So okay. these are independent contractors that are doing this kind of work. Uh, you know, you would hope that we're going to, uh, I'll get Gary to maybe talk to him about uh, their safety protocols for, for that. Again, I would think if there was uh, a government agency that came by and saw them, they might have some issues with it. Unfortunately, this is a contracted, uh, contracted situation. If you see that kind of stuff happening and there's broken glass in that, all you have to do is notify the office and they can speak to them. They've been really good to deal with situations that occur. So that, that was our last question. What I want to recommend to, to people, if they have additional questions, you can send them to the town office and we can answer those questions. We'll be here for a couple more minutes if you want to speak to us as individuals or what have you, and then we can, we can do that. I, I see basically two questions, uh, two hands coming up. There aren't any more hands, right? There's that one, and then there was yourself. Okay. I just wanted to comment on I've seen that these young girls and that doing the garbage. Yeah. Who puts the tender over that? Who's that tender? Is that through the town? That's through the town, yeah. You've got a list in there how they're supposed to be dressed and, and proper protocol for safety and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at our contract and see what we have in there. Okay. You have, we'll allow you your last one because it's only it's a minute it's over. It's a quick one. Uh, Yvonne Foss, 821 5th Avenue. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering what the rules are or bylaws. If you have a neighbor with a huge extending branch off their tree uh, that's already had problems, if it's directly over my property, over my garage, yeah. is there a responsibility for them to cut that down if it's posing a threat to the property? I was told when you have insurance, what's a big deal, you get yourself a new shed. Yeah, no, my, my understanding on that uh, with trees on private property, that's the homeowner's responsibility. However, what, uh, what has happened in the past and what we've seen, and, and Mr. Banks can, uh, can attest to it, is that if you see something like that, if you notify your neighbor that, that, that you're concerned about those trees falling onto your property and damage your property, and you send them a letter, uh, then their insurance company would be responsible for your damage. Because what happens now, if it falls on your tree, on your on your uh, house, the neighbors, it's on your house. Your insurance. No, but what have about to cover it. if it's not a safety issue? You just don't want their branch hanging in your yard. Well, 
I think is, is that what it is, or is it a safety oh, no, issue? No, 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 that's come up yeah. before. Yeah. 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 Right. Over, directly over my, yeah. uh, my garage, yeah. and they've already had problems with that tree. Yeah. And I'm just waiting for this huge branch to come in. And I've notified them, and the okay. response was, well, you have, uh, we, we've all bought insurance. You'll get yourself a new shed. I don't want a new shed. Larry? <laughs> um. If, if you notice anything wrong with that tree, rot or, or potential hazard, and you, and it happened to me because my neighbor's tree fell on, on my cottage, and I called the insurance company and said, okay, you're deductible to $1,000. I said, my deductible? It was their tree. I said, had you written a letter to them and sent it to us uh, stating that there were some issues, some concerns, that I would not be responsible for my deductible? So. so if you, you have to notify, just notify them in writing? In writing, and give a copy to your insurance company. To my insurance company? Yes. Okay, but just to say, not every insurance company is the same, so probably yeah. the suggestion would be to check with your insurance yeah. company. Yeah. So if there's anything you can do to protect yourself, if there's something yeah. Okay. yeah. So on that note, again, thank you so much for coming out. I hope we were able to answer some of your questions. And again, any questions, concerns, if you could please just forward them to the CAO. And we should, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to answer it for you. Thank you very much again.